There's something about Croke Park when the season has ended that I love. It might seem strange because it's quiet. The only noise you hear are the workmen. It's dull and grey, I suppose, when you look around at the seats. But to me, my mind's eye immediately conjures up the excitement, the drama, the crowds bursting to life as the teams parade before the big matches. I love it here. I was lucky enough that I went to school only a few hundred yards from here, Colosh to Wirr in Parnell Square. And then, of course, as I got a bit older, I got to play here a few times. One of the advantages of being at school in Dublin. That handsome-looking fellow in the back row, that was me, would you believe, a midfielder back then. But now, Croke Park is very different to the stadium. It's been huge improvements, and this is now one of the world's finest stadiums. But while it celebrated its centenary in 1984, the last 25 years have seen so much dramatic change. And that's what I'm going to be reflecting on. Because I'm 25 years in broadcasting, I started with RTE in centenary year. So you mightn't agree with my choice of my favourite moments. We have special guests to give their opinions as well, but I hope you'll enjoy them. <laughs> Kerry's three in a row that started in centenary year was a fantastic three in a row, particularly because they had dominated the late 70s, come into 82, they were going for five in a row against Offaly in 82, and they were beaten by that dramatic, heartbreaking goal by Seamus Darby last minute. Nice shot! A goal! A goal! A goal for Offaly! But given what happened in 82, and then Cork beating them in Munster in 83, there was very much a sense of requiem about that Kerry team at the time. So to come back and win the next three All-Irelands was astonishing. The focus of football and quality football at that time was between Dublin and Kerry. Really nobody else could come close. And you would be envious looking on and, and, and wondering what have these people got that they seem to be so special. They're just so far ahead of the posse. And the results kept telling us that. And the only time that they would have a, a serious contest was when they met each other because the team from Ulster, the team from Connacht just didn't count at that time. At that time, that's the way it was, and they were ahead of the rest of us, and um, we could only but admire the skill, the pace, the power of their game. You know, it was just electric stuff. And I suppose if not for the dubs at that time, Kerry would have totally dominated the, the scene. Maybe much like in the last decade, and maybe if we hadn't have been around, they might have had a similar time. And I always think that to come back with Pat Spillane playing the football he did in those three years was astonishing because Pat Spillane's career looked to be finished with a chronic knee injury. Supplying it for the half forwards for Pat Spillane. This is an important kick. That's why he's the great player that he is. And when Kerry needed it most. That great Kerry team, I mean, some of them were just finishing in that stage. They were, they were coming to the end of their career, but. They were good, when we look back on it, people have said maybe, you know, it was bad to see the dominating, but they were good because other teams wanted to get there and other teams followed suit, especially the Dubs started to get their level of fitness up there. Kerry ahead by three points, 2-11 for Kerry, 2-8 for Dublin, the closest call they've had for a long time. Timmy Dow just outside the 13-metre line, back towards John Kennedy. Can he make absolutely sure? He certainly does, and the cup is going back to Kerry. And then the northern teams started saying, well, look, at if we want to compete with these, they started competing in the leagues with them, we want to compete in the championship, we've got to take it to the same level that they're at. And I think that's what happened. And so in the long run, we look back, and they were actually good for, for, the, for the association. There's a goal here for Port Squid. Much to my disappointment, I suppose, that the final of those three in a row in 1986 was at Tyrone's expense. And unfortunately, at that time, probably Tyrone should have beaten them, uh, being six, seven or eight points up maybe into the second half, having put a penalty over the bar, which if it had it gone in, who knows what would have happened. Put it over the bar. The goal was there for the taking. Instead, he's content with the point. But actually, Kerry turned that seven or eight point deficit into, I think, winning by eight or nine at the end. So it just showed you what they were about at that time. And this was a team coming to the end of his day, so to speak which ultimately it proved it was, because they didn't get another Ireland for 11 years after that. O'Shea, who's remained on for the full 70 minutes. I remember being in the crowd that day, and there was a, a, a you know, the feeling is, when, when is it going to happen for Kerry? Well, it was a bit of a hit and hope shot, but he scored. 
the Ulster breakthrough hadn't happened at that time and uh, you know the, the, the result was inevitable in the end where Kerry won pulling up. So a look of resignation on Art McRory's face but let's give him credit for taking his team through to the very first All-Ireland final. It's a team I think we'll see back in Croke Park in finals again. From an individual performance point of view, what stands out in my mind is a football one. And it was Frank McGuigan for Tyrone in the Ulster final against Armagh, where he scored 11 points. It was an extraordinary achievement uh, from play. He scored with his left foot, with his right foot. He punched the ball over the bar. It was one of the all-time great individual scoring performances that I remember. It was fantastic. <laughs> A lot of footballers can't score with their left foot and their right foot. The good ones can. But it was the, his comfort in running with the ball and kicking with the right, kicking with the left. He was a great forward. And just that day, he was just... He just was a different league. Kicked them with his left foot, with his right foot. He did this famous solo dummy that he was the man that virtually introduced this, and lots of people do it nowadays, but he was the first that I ever saw it, and I don't remember anybody before that. So 11 points in Ulster final, that, that will take some equaling, all from play. Uh, that made Frank McGuigan something special. And that was all based on natural talent because he didn't excel in preparing as an athlete in those days. It was all down to natural talent. Lovely bit of feeling there by Frank McGuigan. I got to know Frank quite well. Um, lovely man and, you know, we all know how his career was effectively cut, cut short by a terrible car accident. I think you, ca you couldn't help but wonder subsequently when, when Tyrone played in the 86 All-Ireland Final against Kerry and, and gave Kerry huge problems and went seven points up, that had Frank McGuigan played in that game, I think almost certainly Tyrone would have won the All-Ireland much earlier than they, their first All-Ireland much earlier than they did. Early memories from the 80s, the iconic moment of the late 80s would be John Fenton's goal for Cork against Limerick. It was a sublime piece of skill, a superb strike. He was one of the great strikers of the ball. Ground strike, got one touch, pulled on the ball, and it went like a bullet to the top corner of the net past a great goalkeeper, the late Tommy Quaid. It was a fantastic goal where he sort of changed his mind uh, with the first strike, I thought, and then passed the ball on, tapped the ball on forward with his hurl, and then made this fantastic swing, uh, a ball that got into an arc and never left that, and just dipped then under the crossbar. It was one of those dream goals. I saw it that evening on the Sunday game, and I think, you know, it's probably 15 or 16 at the time, just couldn't wait to get down to the field to try it ourselves, you know, I think every, every young player in the club was trying to score a goal from a, from a ground ball from 45, 50 yards out and it will go down, I think, as the greatest goal any of my generation have seen anyway, I think it was absolutely incredible. Into space, Tomas Mulcahy with Leonard Enright, comes for John Fenton, oh, what a brilliant goal! That's one of the finest goals I think I've ever seen in Stadium. But from a TV technology point of view, if it was scored now, there'd be far more cameras, far more camera angles. You'd see every, you'd be able to enjoy it and savour the wonder of it from so many different angles and views. Whereas back then it was the, you know, the shot from the halfway line high above the pitch, close up of the strike, and then a wide shot as the ball flies to the net. Now there'll be cameras behind the goals, you can zoom in on every element of it. And it's a sign of how broadcasting has changed as well. But if I could see one thing again, I'd love to see that goal scored now with the modern technology. It's 
The late 80s also gave us another one of those great rivalries. It was a bit different from the traditional Cork tip or Kilkenny, that triumvirate providing a rivalry. In the late 80s, it was Tip and Galway. Cyril Farrell had a great Galway team in, in, in those days. And Tip came along and ended the famine, as they called it, when Richie Stakelin made a speech in 87 when they won their Munster title. But they were unable to get past Galway in the first couple of years. And uh, Farrell's team was a, was a great Galway team. And they were eventually lost to Tipperary in the 89 semi-final. But 89 had the two semi-finals on the same day in Croke Park, and whereas Tip beat Galway in what everyone expected to be the big match, Offaly were playing Antrim in the other semi-final, and this was expected to be a comfortable win for Offaly, as it was for most teams against Antrim in the semi-finals in those days. But the Antrim team caused one of the great, great upsets of the last 30 or 40 years by beating Offaly, a fine Offaly team and it was a, an amazing victory. This is Roy Mannion, the final whistle. Remember today, Antrim qualify for the very first time since 1943 for the All-Ireland Hurling Final of 1989. And is she happy? Who would blame her? She's a proud lady today, and that is really what the GA is all about. But I'll always remember Offaly, given that it was such a shattering defeat for them, that they stood and waited while the Antrim players celebrated for ages on the pitch. And the Offaly players lined up and applauded the Antrim team off the field, which was a really magnanimous and generous and proper thing to do. But given that they knew they were going to get a lot of stick when they went home for losing that match, I thought it was, it was a great element of sportsmanship from those Offaly players. Oh, look at that. A marvellous day for Hurling. tends to go in, 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 it's almost like waves of hurling is dominant, football is dominant. Maybe the greatest achievement in the last 25 years was Cork winning the double in 1990. So difficult to do, it's so difficult to win one All-Ireland, to win both in the same year was momentous. It's given the chase on here. Coleman going back, missed by Dermot Fahey. Sean Tracy coming up from his full back position, but it's set up a chance. A goal by Kevin Hennessy! A goal after 48 seconds! Just a few seconds to go. The referee has a check on the watch. He's called time. Cork are the All Ireland champions. The McCarthy Cup is on its way back to Lee side once again. The first part of a possible double has been achieved. We had some great players that played hurling and football, like Jimmy Barry Murphy, Ray Cummins, Dennis Collin, and then you had, of course, Teddy McCarthy, who um, won uh, All Ireland honours in, in hurling and football in the same year, which is absolutely unique. Teddy, weary, delighted, elated, I'm sure, as well. Back in two weeks with the footballers. He's set to rejoin that squad very shortly. I've never seen anyone like Teddy McCarthy to fetch a ball out of the sky, both in hurling and football. Definitely the best fielder of a ball I've ever seen in my life. But will we ever see what he did again? I doubt it very much. And I just don't think it's feasible anymore for a player to play at that level in both codes. That's a final we're also looking forward to. Cork v Mead. That should be another great game. There was great rivalry in Gaelic football. There's been Dublin Meads, there's been Cork, Cork Kerry, Posterone and Armagh uh, at stages, and then you have Galway Mayo, so we'll say were the big ones. But I think that, you know, that uh, the, the Meath Cork one was probably one of the worst we've had, you know, in the sense that it got really serious. I think it was a reflection of how serious the GA was becoming in terms of preparation of teams. It was a lifestyle that players were adopting now. It wasn't just go out and train two nights a week, it was a lifestyle and it was hugely intense and there was a, a sense of mission, of, of almost 
evangelical zeal to what you were pursuing. And the first replay since 1972 is underway. Dave Barry, taken by Mick Lyons. Well, and truly caught and taken down. Free to Meath. I remember there was an almost this electricity of tension between those two teams. That they, there, there was a genuine hatred between them at the time. And I, I think it's something that just builds up when you have two teams that are dominant. I mean, bear in mind, four years, those, they won two All-Irelands each in those four years. Meath won the first two, and then Cork won the next two. But I think at that time, Cork appeared in four All-Ireland finals, which was amazing after Kerry's long run and being there so often that another team from Munster should come back and contest four finals. We always looked at the Kerry team, the great Kerry team that won eight All-Irelands. They always had a kind of a, an ease about their movement. And they didn't make too many enemies, funnily enough. They just played this beautiful football that wiped, wiped opponents out. Now, the Meath men were tough men, as we all know, and that was a quality Meath team. When we look at them now and put them on paper and look at them, like say Hayes McEntee in the middle of the field, they had a great full back lane, good half back lane. I mean, they're full forward lane, Oroke, Stafford and Flynn, you know. Then you had Cork emerging, and they were the teams that initially, that initially broke, if you like, the Dublin Kerry dominance. And, and then you had, uh, you know, in, th in those years, a huge rivalry, and that sometimes bordered on the almost hatred of each other. Some of the others are shaping up to one another as well. You know, people talk about the famous holiday in January of 89, when they both found themselves in the same apartment complex in Playa de Lingles in the Canaries. Um, and they found this almost unbearable being in such close proximity to one another. And he's been sent off after just six and a half minutes. But famously, a man who happened to be there at the time as well was Mick Holden, the Dublin footballer, and, and he got a few of them in the bar one night and said, Jesus, lads, you'll be dead long enough and there won't be a football around. And if there is, it'll be mine and I won't let you play with it. And they all burst out laughing and it, it kind of brought home the childishness of what was going on. A tense atmosphere. An occasion when the referee needs all his wits about him and a little bit of luck as well. This was a different type of football. This was attritional, this was intense, and it was deeply personal between those two teams. And now the Corkonians must begin to wonder whether that double of hurling at football is on once more. And let's be honest about it, both sides got stuck into one another. You know, the physicality was one of the big aspects of those four matches. It was very difficult matches to referee, you know, and it was it was, it was like a boiling pot. I mean, this was, this was, the Crow Park was like a coliseum when both of these teams met over that period, you know. Hayes. Linking up with Peggy. This is a great move. Can they finish it? Oh, it's a great save! A goal would do nicely for them. Hay stopped by Barry Copley. Copley says it was a fair shoulder to shoulder. This is the battle of the big two in Gaelic football. Ten minutes to go. And the deficit is cut back. Thanks to the trusty boot of Brian Stafford. The three and a half minutes left. Stafford has cut it back to a two-point game. Cork beaten by Meade in 1967. Beaten by Meade in 1987. Beaten after a replay in 1988. But they were fantastic matches to watch, particularly because you knew they didn't like each other, the fans didn't like each other. It was great intensity. The double has been achieved! And I suppose it's those kind of rivalries that we all remember when we look back on the GAA. Sam Maguire goes proudly back to Lee's side. It's Sam and it's Liam in the one year for Cork. Looking for Pori Conway. Is this clear? It's hard to believe that it's Kerry that's in trouble. Still Pori Conway. I suppose one of the great things about the GA is you do get one-off complete magical days. There were several of them in the 1990s. In football, the Clare footballers beat Kerry in a Munster final. I mean, you just... No bookie would hear a mention of it. Uh, Clare playing outstanding, although not getting the results that their amount of possession deserves. I remember going down to a Clare training session around that time and John Mohan had them back in, in, in the hotel afterwards and they were on pasta diets. Uh, and that was so far ahead of its time because it was kind of traditional. I, I remember kind of, for example, the Tipperary hurling team. 
they would train and then they'd go back and have steak and chips. And this might be at 10 o'clock at night. And when you think of it now, it's absolutely ridiculous that you'd be stuffing your, your body with steak and chips at 10 o'clock at night. But Mon had that kind of modern approach to preparation and diet and nutrition. And he was, he was way ahead of his time. Up for the carry man, a break pass down to Tom Morrissey. Gets it inside to Pence McInerney. Back to Colin Canty! Hi-ya! The batter Canty has done it! The kingdom has been rocked to its very foundations. And it was the famous day when Claire under John Mohan had a fantastic run and beating Kerry in the Munster final, and Marty Morrissey finished his commentary with the memorable line, there won't be a cow milked in Clare tonight, which caught in everyone's imagination. So much so that I remember a year later, Aaron Zyle were in the Leinster Club football final. Aaron Zyle are the club team from Finglas, and Keith Barr and Johnny Barr, who were also on the Dublin team, were interviewed after Aaron Zyle won, and Keith Barr said, there won't be a cow milked in Finglas tonight, <laughs> which kind of summed it up. <laughs> Mead's rivalry with Cork in the late 80s uh, was reverted back to their traditional rivalry with Dublin for one of the all-time memorable occasions in GAA. It was a very interesting time because soccer had taken over, gripped the country. We had done so well in Euro 88 with Jack Charlton and then Italian 90 and everyone knows the huge impact that had with us reaching the quarter-final and the economic boom and the whole feel-good factor. And it was a key time for the GA. How was the GA going to uh, recover from all of this and, and, and try and regain their place as the premier sport? And in 1991, Almost by accident, it grabbed the Irish public attention when Dublin were drawn against Meath in the first round of the Leinster Championship. First match was a draw, second match was a draw after extra time, the third match was a draw after extra time, it was incredible. And I went to a fourth match between the teams and as each game was drawn and went on to the next stage, more and more people were sucked into it and grabbed by the intensity of it and the drama of it. And I think the big thing that them games did for the GEA, in my opinion, was there was people that weren't really GEA people that started watching GEA that time. And that was the great thing about it. This match just took over everything. It was talk show, it was phone-in, it was... It took the GEA onto a perch that it couldn't have imagined when you had Italian 90, when you had Euro 88. It was all soccer. And, and that was so new to us because we never had a soccer team in international, major international finals. So that was all the talk. And suddenly, this Dublin Mead thing just became extraordinary. It almost brought the, the, the showbiz, the razzmatazz to the, uh, to the GA, you know, the, the full houses in Crow Park and all the different uh, end to end stuff and the different twists and turns that those matches take. And the first three matches had all been on Sundays. I presented Sunday Sport on the radio at the time. So the fourth match, the third replay, was fixed for a Saturday. And I was thrilled because it gave me a chance to go to it rather than being in the radio studio. Changes we were speculating from Dublin are materialising. Paul Curran here is on the 40. Tommy Carr still right half back. Drilling this one forward towards Charlie Redmond, who's looking to get the centre. That's closed down, however, by Liam Harnan. Paul Clark is playing at full forward. It's uh, Mick Galvin top of the left. Declan Sheehan top of the right. And into midfield has come Jack Sheedy. Meanwhile, it's David Beggy looking for score number one for the afternoon. Superbly closed down by the very mobile Tommy Carr. And Meath and Dublin had a very, you know, tough rivalry. There was great respect, but nobody gave one another an inch. And the physicality of those games was extremely tough. And it wasn't, it wasn't a place to be faint-hearted. Against Beelan. Trading the pass inside to Bernard Flynn. Sells a beautiful dummy. And from 20 metres out, is kicked it over the bar. Meath's first point from play. And Bernard Flynn's first score of the afternoon. So Tommy Hart gets the second half underway, seven points to five. Dublin, the leaders, and Jerry McEntee straight away trying to redress that situation. Keith Barr. 
you had to get in, you had to get stuck into your players, you know, the opposition, and it was going to go down to, you always knew it was going to go down to the wire. Need a need of a goal. And I remember eventually Meade winning the fourth game and it all started from their own end line with Martin O'Connell having one foot out of play and eight passes later the ball was in the Dublin net. It was a heartbreaking uh, movement. I was actually right from the, the uh, canal end right up to Hill 16. I mean, the Dublin players never got a hand on the ball. I mean, it was fluent football f from Mead, and it ended up with a fantastic goal and an unlikely scorer in Foley, and it was heartbreaking in, in the end. But that's sport, and you just have to get on with it. Now they're going for a win, which we scarcely thought they were going to have ten minutes ago. We had them completely written off. Definitely, you know, when you when you look back at GA and look back at them games, we have to say, I mean, it helped the GA in Dublin uh, and in me, of course, but it did a lot for GA all over all over the country because it made it easier to promote our games. It made it easier for coaches, for managers, for clubs to sell sell tickets to everything else. We were writing the Mead obituary up here. We obviously hadn't the faith that the players had in their own ability. We should have known because we've seen them ever since 1986 combined superbly. You can't keep a good Meath team down. McQuillan. They've won it. Meath have won by a point. It's an amazing win. A late, late goal by Kevin Foley. A winning point by David Beggy. It's taken four games, nearly five and three quarter hours of wholly committed action to finally resolve a match that grabbed the nation's attention. And of course, the, the extraordinary thing as well about that was because Meath came through that, having in almost all of the games looked like they were ready to fall over and, and, and be knocked out, because they came through that and had this marathon run through the championship, I think they played 11 games in that championship, which was extraordinary, there was almost an assumption that they were going to win the All-Ireland. And of course, they were down with other ideas and uh, Meath, Meath never did get that All-Ireland. Back over the last 25 years, one of the outstanding features is how well Offaly have done. Offaly is a small county, people forget that, and yet they can compete at the highest level in hurling and football. It's a fantastic achievement with such a population. They don't win a lot of minor titles, etc., but they still bring so many players through. And for Offaly to be able to compete at a top level in football and hurling with a small population is a fantastic achievement. Half time position then, Limerick ahead by six points. Is it enough? We had an amazing final in 94 between a very good Limerick team and Offaly, where Limerick seemed to have it won, they were way ahead, and Offaly came with one of the great late comebacks to win a thrilling final. Limerick get the free in. It's one of those days when things are happening for them. They've been on a bit of a roll all season, and it's continued right here in this all Ireland final, and Gary Kirby has got point number six for the day. And just five and a half minutes left, and it's 2.13 to 1.11, 19 to 14. I remember um, watching it at home on TV, glued to it, obviously, and it just seemed all the way through that Limerick were going to win. The Offaly team needing possession. They've got to get a goal or two quickly. You know, that Offaly team, you could never really write them off. They just had total self-belief in themselves and they were a fantastic bunch of hurlers. Like Limerick were literally cruising, I think they were six, seven ahead all the way through the second half and it just seemed a matter of awfully just gone and, and, and with five minutes to go they got the first 21 yard free down and the hill 16 end. Johnny Dooley now, beating the attempted block, fired in well there. 
Billy Dooley taking it, trying to get away. He's fouled by Joe O'Connor on the 20 metre line. Johnny Dooley got a 21 yard free and there was doubt whether he'd go for it or not. The Limerick had, had, had lined the goal. Would he go for a point? I think he's been instructed to do so. He's going for a goal and he's got it! And he blasted a terrific shot to the net and suddenly Offaly were on song. They got a goal immediately afterwards and then took over completely. Not feeling that they can turn the tide. But O'Connor's in! It's another one! It's another goal! But O'Connor has got it! Off clear in front! And it was an amazing turnabout in a game that seemed all lost for Offaly and won for Limerick, but the, the absolute skill level of Offaly won in the end. Extraordinarily cruel match, I'd have to say, from a Limerick point of view. I mean, they seemed to be in cruise control, and next thing Johnny Dooley scores that goal and straight away Pat O'Connor gets another and it's just turned on its head and uh, and suddenly you're watching Billy Dooley dropping over points for fun. Well, whoever said the match is never over until the final whistle. It was never truer than in this case here as Billy Dooley fires in another beauty. Fired outside towards Billy Dooley on his left hand side. It's just like routine practice now. He's come out the field, back again to Billy Dooley, nobody marking him, and that's three in a row. A superb performance by the young man from Clarine in County Offaly, from the Sir Kieran's Club. My big memory of that is that in those days, journalists were still allowed into dressing rooms. So we literally went down, dressing room tunnel, door opened and you walked in and you're standing on fellas' towels and everything. It was an extraordinary thing to look back on. And literally within minutes of the Limerick team coming into their dressing room, we were in walking around with our tape recorders, what did you think, how does it feel like? And, and these guys were just devastated. And yet they had the dignity to talk to people. And, and you know, nowadays it's very sanitized. We go down to a little auditorium and people are brought in and they sit at a, at a desk and we ask them questions from in a very formal way. But in those days, you literally went into a wake and just stood on their towels and, and, and asked them to talk you through it. It was, a, it was a very, very cruel day for Limerick, I think, but that was a great Offaly team. And I, I think one thing that maybe people overlook is that Offaly team would I almost feel they underachieved. They had such great, talented hurlers. I think Limerick were stunned. I think it was just, I think they're still stunned to this day about what happened. And of course, you had the twist that the Offaly were managed by a Limerick man, Eamon Cregan. What a comeback. And Eamon Cregan has masterminded a famous victory. He would have given anything for it not to be Limerick that Offaly did that to. Congratulations with him. See, what makes the GA different is um, it's your people. When soccer or rugby players come in, they're transferred in, they transfer out, whatever. In GA, it's your people. So if you do have that great day in the sun, the fellas out there are neighbours of yours. It could be your carpenter, it could be your milkman, your school teacher, a fellow who works in the bank. It could be, you know, my sister works with his sister. There's a bond. There's a unique bond, you know, because they are your own people. But what a day for the faithful county. And that's what makes it unique. And that's what makes it so emotional. Lovely occasion. Proud youngster. And in terms of stickmen, I suppose, we might have gone down as the team of the decade. They might have gone down as the team of the decade in the 90s. We both won two each. Uh, but they were fantastic stickmen, there was no doubt. They had fantastic skill. And they had this inner belief in themselves that they could turn a game. Jack Boothman, first time as GA president to present the Liam McCarthy Cup to Martin Hanamy of St. Rhinas in Offaly. Offaly are the All-Ireland hurling champions for the third time ever. What a day. I have particular cause to remember this because my wife is from a very big family in Donegal. Now, with Dublin winning the semi-final against Clare, Dublin were in the All-Ireland final, and they were hot favourites because they're playing Donegal, who had never, ever been in an All-Ireland final. Obviously, had to get tickets for as many as she could. Her brother had played with Donegal. Her sister was secretary of the Donegal Supporters Club, but there still wasn't enough, you know, for 14 of them with kids and grandchildren, brothers and sisters and aunties and uncles. So it was a great, great... Um, chase for tickets. Michael was mentioning at the um, start of this about the deafening ovation that greeted Donegal. It really was something else.
waited so long for this, over a hundred years, to finally make the breakthrough. There had been a sense, definitely in the 80s, of Ulster teams turning up in Croke Park, being psychologically weak. Certainly the, the Leinster champions or the Munster champions would never have worried about Ulster opposition. I would have been very friendly with Tommy Carr, the Dublin captain at the time, and there was this incredible sense of presumption around the city going into that 92 All-Ireland final. And I knew that Tommy was very concerned about this. You know, we trained really, really hard, and we trained hard. We, we got it together late, and we trained hard, but we got it right because we weren't tired. And going into the match against Dublin, we, we always kept saying, you know, team meetings and everything else, that if we got over the semi-final, because we never had got past the semi-final before that, if we could get over the semi-final, we'd won the final. And I remember the Donegal that year, and I do remember the semi-final, and particularly against Mayo, and it was a dreadful game. And I remember being at the match and the whole story was the pick of both those teams wouldn't have a stand a ghost chance against Dublin. Maybe we got a wee bit of luck with the draw. We got a bit of luck that maybe that was the same year that, that uh, Clare put Kerry out of the Munster Championship. You don't know these things can just go right for you and uh, we got there. The referee awards a penalty after eight minutes of the first half. I think every All-Ireland final turns on something. That looked a very harsh decision. Charlie Redmond kicking and he's put it right. And Dublin were on top early on and they missed a penalty that day and you know maybe that's the way the game turned to give us a wee bit of confidence and we finished well in the first half and probably it's one of the days that every single player played well. Both sides looking for the early advantages and that was Keith Barr taken out of it. I think Dublin didn't see it coming. I just think maybe their, maybe their attitude was wrong going into it and when, when you go into a match like that there when things start going wrong on the field it's very hard to change it. So another white. Maybe when we look back and we had a lot of very good footballers. There were a lot of there were very talented footballers at our clubs and they were very talented. But we made the break too late and uh, you know we're lucky enough to make it and get it, but it was late. Maybe if we'd have won one earlier, we might have got two, but I think we're we're lucky enough to get one now. The miraculous medal around his neck is obviously not working all the time anyway. <laughs> oh you have little faith. <laughs> Well, the day, the day of the All-Ireland final, uh, the day of the All-Ireland final, I just, I knew we were going to win the match, I don't know why, but I just felt that after the game I was going to be close enough to the referee, or close enough to the ball to make sure I was going to have the ball as well. Tommy Suger was the referee, I think he wanted the ball as well that day. Martin McHugh there, anxious for the full-time whistle, and it's over, and Tony Gore has won the All-Ireland final! We had a great tug and match at the end of the game, but I wasn't going to let go, and in the end up the crowds came out jumping on me, and he had to let go to get off the field, so... Why I thought like that, I don't know, and I have it 17 years later. I still have the ball here. It wasn't used since. I kept it and made sure I held on to it that day. Even when I went up to, up to get Sam, I had the ball in my hand going up against Sam. This Martin McHugh, in my view, one of the very finest Gaelic footballers we've seen over the last 10 years. And I've got all the lads to sign in the ring out. So it's, it's great for me to have him, for maybe later on my family to have him that there. So the longer it goes on, I suppose, it's great to have it. But afterwards, it was chaotic, it was unbelievable. And in our house, you know, we were putting up people coming down the stairs. I was on the early mor morning island the next morning, so I'm coming down the stairs at five o'clock in the morning or whatever. There's a fella kind of asleep on the stairs, and as I go past me, he says, who are you? And I says, I own the house, who are you? There's bodies everywhere, but that kind of encapsulates the chaos that goes with uh, a county winning. All I can tell you, um what it means to Donegal to win that out of Ireland is uh, yet when you go out, people still come talking to you. When you go away from home, especially to America, you meet Donegal people, that's all they talk about is that out of Ireland <laughs> victory. And you just like maybe at times to forget about it, maybe hopefully one another will forget about it. They'll, if you go into a bar, they'll buy you a drink. If days you even go into places uh, with Donegal people, particularly away from home, and you might buy a dinner or something, the next thing the dinner's paid for. That's what it means. It meant everything to it. And I mean, yeah, I'll, they'll never forget it. This was the Holy Grail. This wasn't a Dublin or a Kerry or a Galway or, you know, the old aristocrats turning up and, and taking what they would have considered their rights. This was kind of, my God, we have reached the top of the mountain. And, and, and you could see it in Donegal people, the emotion of them that day. It was extraordinary.
was really the All Ireland for all the D's. I mean, we had Down one in '91, Donegal in '92, Derry '93, Down '94, Dublin '95. So it was that span. <laughs> if you if you had the letter D in your in the, the first letter in, in your name, you were going to win in All Ireland. But I mean, that was that was a real dominance uh, of Ulster football. Donegal's win kicked off an extraordinary uh, explosion in Ulster football success. And we should remember that a great down team had won it the year before, uh, Pete McGrath's team. And I suppose that was the, the, the confidence that Down gave to the rest of Ulster teams because Ulster teams would be playing each other regularly, obviously in the championship and that. And when they saw that one team from the province could go the whole way, it just gave this new impetus to everyone else. But then along came Derry, who'd never won it before. And this seemed to give a belief to the Ulster counties, who've always had this incredible deep passion for Gaelic games, uh, but weren't rewarded with national success. And to give it a context, Ulster people were 100 years really waiting for success. And for people to keep it going for 100 years uh, says an awful lot about them finally reaching the Holy Grail. We've got to remember the political situation was so awful for, for so long but it gave people their sense of identity in the Catholic community, etc. And it's Henry Downey who takes Sam back to Derry. Oh, Sammy boy, they'll sing tonight. I think there's a historical context here that we need to remember in the, in the sense of Ulster. During the troubled times in the 70s and 80s, you had many difficulties uh, for, for teams in, in Ulster to, to really concentrate totally on, on Gaelic football. The troubles had an effect. There's no, there's no doubt about it. The troubles had an effect. You know, I mean, I remember myself travelling up through the north, and you were in the car, and, and if there were GE bags in the car, you were stopped. The car was searched, and everything else. Now that was me as Donny Gall person driving through it. I mean, the northern counties. I mean, you know, taking clubs and everything else. You know, I mean, it must have been terrible. And I, I think they were all. They were, I hear them telling the stories themselves. Stop going to training and search to keep them late for training and everything else. It's understandable now when I look back on it, you know, the, what they were under, the pressure under and everything else. And it's great credit for them to keep it going. And, you know, it, you know when Down came through in 91, it was, was, was great to see. And it's all over, and Down have won the All-Ireland. That dominance by Ulster football was great, it really was great. So I took huge pleasure from all of those victories just to see what it meant to those people. In the presence of the President of Ireland, DJ Kane is the happiest man in Ireland right now. As the Ulster success continued, we had Armagh and Tyrone ready to burst on the scene in the early 2000s. When I look back on the last 25 years, Probably my favourite moment is Clare winning the Munster final in 95. And they beat Limerick in the final. Now, the Cork and Tip people felt it wasn't a real final because it was Clare and Limerick. In fact, I remember going up and Michael Doyle from Tipperary said to me as I walked up, are you, go are you going up to the B final as I walked up? And Thurlis wasn't full on that day. To be there on that day, there was probably only about 10,000 Clare people there, we estimate, on that day. They'd, they'd just been so disillusioned with the defeats of 93, 94 and the league final of 95 that they just probably couldn't face it anymore, a lot of them would. And you know, I like Des, who, you know, Clare Parentage. Um, an awful lot of expats travel from Dublin and places like that and overseas, and I would know people that came from New York and from London for that game. And The referee today is Johnny MacDonald from Tipperary, 41-year-old official, taking charge of his first Munster Senior Final, and it's Limerick who won the toss. Up. So, yeah, well, I suppose we, we, we really trained hard. We noticed there was a new regime. Mike McNamara was in with Sherlock Nan and Tony Considine, and uh, um, the training was really up. The physical stakes were massive, and this was a total shock to us, you know, uh, running up and down hills and five-mile runs and stuff like that. That was alien to any hurling team at the time, never mind Clare. So we thought it was mad, but we, we did it because I think we just understood by the way the management had gone about their business that if you didn't want to do it, you could stay at home. David Fitzgerald, here's the goal, shots fired for Clare. He scored! The one thing that Gerlach Nan understood about Clare was they needed to quicken their hurlings. They needed to hurl, move the ball a hell of a lot quicker. And the puck has been taken, and Gary Kirby has been fouled by not one, by about two or three Clare players, I thought. Clare 
added this huge intensity and the uh, training regime and the super fitness which carried that particular team through. Now, Kilkenny beat them in the league final well in, in 95. After which, Gerlock Nan famously announces that they'd win the Munster Championship. And Anthony Daly and a few of the players would openly admit they were looking at each other in the dressing room, listening to Gerlock Nan saying this and saying, catch yourself on. They couldn't see it coming. None of us could see it coming. Limerick were Munster champions and had been obviously robbed by Offaly in 94 in that all Ireland final. And uh, Limerick really expected that this was their main year and they were going to go all the way that year. And Out it comes as far as James e. O'Connor drops short and that's all the James e. O'Connor, six points. What a performance by the number 12. They played with an intensity that other teams, maybe slightly more skillful teams, couldn't match. And they just, they were, they became an awesome force in hurling because they were willing to put their bodies on the line in every single position on the field. And they brought this intensity to the game that I think it took a few years for other teams to cop onto it and realize that if you want to win in All-Ireland, you have got to do what they do. And that is get yourself incredibly fit and play with that intensity for 74, 75 minutes. Fergal Hagerty, aware that he might have been hooked, going for the score. It's there! Clarence suddenly hold a As the game went on, it seemed inevitable that Clare were going to triumph, but well, as players we were all still scared that something was going to go wrong and I think the Clare supporters invaded the pitch. The crowd are on the field, they think it's all over. They're told to go back by the referee. I remember all of us thinking, talking about it afterwards, thinking that something was going to go wrong, the match would be abandoned or there'd be an objection or something. And uh, we'll all say that the 95 Munster final was our greatest day of all the good days. I remember stopping in Abbey Leagues on the way home from that match and in a pub in, in Abbey Leagues where Clare fellas who had been going there for years and being from a Clare family I understood what the hunger meant but fellas who I knew were in the pub having a drink in Morrissey's in Abbey Leagues and as each one came in it was the most extraordinary sight. I had a couple of dubs with me. There was no words spoken between these fellas. They were hugging each other hugging each other in a way, there was no need for them to speak, but there was tears, there was loads of tears. It was incredible. Big grown men, it was not, nothing to do with alcohol. They were only walking in just to, it was a meeting point for the Clare, the Dublin Clare people, who weren't going to get to enjoy the great come, coming home that night and the thing. But I remember just big men hugging each other, real tight, real strong, it was, it was pure raw emotion, and it showed just what it meant to people. And that applies to any county, but for me, I understood it because it was Clare. Leitrim winning the Connacht final in 94, it could be argued was the ultimate Cinderella story because they're the smallest county, smallest population. And of course, so many of their population don't live at home. They have to go away to work. So many of them go abroad, so many of them in Dublin. The fact that Leitrim used to train in County Meath because the Dublin fellas could go as far as there in the Leitrim and they'd meet halfway reflected again just what Irish economic and social life is for small counties like Leitrim. <laughs> I finished with Mayo in 1991, um, didn't manage anyone in 1992, and Leitrim came knocking on my door at the end of the 1992 championship. They had been very close, uh, running Roscommon to a few points in the previous two championships. And I, uh, I uh, thought about it, saw the enthusiasm that was in the county. We have a county, or we had a county of 25,000 people, of 12 senior clubs, but who were passionately involved. You didn't have, you know, Leitrim soccer leagues or anything else at that time. There was only one thing that they wanted. And it's guard inspector Mick Curley from Galway who starts his second successive Connacht final. And already, as you'll gather, some switches in positions. Mickey Quinn, for instance, has gone to midfield. 
As we watch Pat Fallon advance, looking for the first score of the match. Tapped in, oh, it's a goal! A disastrous mistake! What people need to realise is that winning a Connacht Championship for Leitrim at that time was as good as Donegal winning in All-Ireland or Derry winning in All-Ireland or Mayo winning in All-Ireland. So this is a very straightforward kick for Aidan Rooney, looking for his first point of the day. And it's Leitrim second, and now there's just a point in it. Breakthroughs of any kind are very important in the GA. The one in Leitrim uh, when they won the Connacht title there. Um, Clare uh, when they won the Munster title after so, so many years and how difficult it would be to do that. That's the equaliser, and it's Paul Kieran who's got it. They have missed an earlier one, but not this. These are wonderful moments for people from GA counties who traditionally have not been as successful as others. And I suppose it gives great hope and, and, and it makes GA and Gaelic Games come alive in those counties because for them at that time it's probably as good as in All Ireland. And once again, joyous celebration for the fans who've travelled here in their thousands. And I actually went down to watch the match and I was shouting my head off for Leitrim at the game and I was at the, out in the field afterwards jumping about. So that's what I know, and I was after one in all Ireland a couple of years before that, but that's what it meant, you know, to be there, to be part of it. It's just, it's great to see, it's great to be at occasions like that there. They don't happen that much. So Leitrim stretch their lead, and now they lead by four points. It's great to be there, I couldn't believe it, like, to be there, to see, to see the scenes, and, you know, everybody deserves their day in the sun, and it's great that Leitrim had it that day. A free end for Leitrim. This is the sweetest day that so many of these Leitrim fans can ever remember. Players are already congratulating one another. Rooney kicks. That's gone wide, and it's all over. And Leitrim are the kind of champions. And John O'Mahony has done it. He did it with his native Mayo. And now he's done it with Leitrim. Just the second time the county has ever won the provincial title. 67 years ago, they lasted it. You know, I will forever remember the passion that pushed us across the line in 94 and been on the pitch for a full hour after the game just as you would in Crow Park nowadays uh, it was something to behold the chairman of the Connacht Council making the presentation to Declan Darcy 1927 1994 there'll be leaks from people all over Ireland perhaps all over the world with tears in the eyes celebrating the return of the Connacht Championship the cup goes to lovely Leitrim. I remember Michal and Maria Hertig's commentary, like to paraphrase it, he was talking about, as they all swarmed on for the presentation of the cup, Michal referred to Leitrim men in heaven, leaning on the banisters of heaven, looking down on this joyous scene for Leitrim people. For them, at that time, it's probably as good as in all Ireland. And any degree of success actually has a great knock-on effect, not just about winning the trophy, it's about what it does for the people of the county, gives them that sense of pride, gives the youngsters that opportunity to become part of the Gaelic Games scene again. And it's true for big counties as well, but I suppose it's, it's particularly encouraging for the minnow counties, as they're called, in relative terms, who haven't had that level of success. The cup goes to lovely Leitrim. There's loads of great scores. It's very difficult when someone asks you, you know, what were the great scores? And funny enough, um, I don't always think of goals. You know, I think of Morris Fitzgerald's point for Kerry against Dublin in football. He's got it. He's it. In hurling, I think of Kieran Kerry's point for Limerick against Clare in '96. Clare, the All Ireland champions. Limerick, mad to tear into their neighbours. Uh, the game right in the balance until the end, and this is where great players show their greatness. Kieran Carey, who was colossal for Limerick in the 90s, uh, winning the ball and careering up the field and getting a fantastic score that just brought, you know, Limerick people screaming with delight and Clare people bitterly, bitterly disappointed, but looking on in sheer admiration. Is there much time left? We had a couple of injuries. Here comes Kieran Carey. Charge of the light brigade. 45 meters out. He's a chance to score. He's put it high. He's put it over. The Limerick captain has scored. A minute into injury time. And the All Ireland champions out. Our Limerick to advance to the Munster final. It was a combination of the skill level required and determination and focus on him to get through so, such a long way 
uh, despite the hefty challenges from Clare, and remain cool and calm with the finishing shot, under pressure to get it, it was fantastic. And that is one of the great scores, because you think of what you'd like to see in a hurler, and what you'd like to see in most hurlers is when a game is on the line, that a fella has the moral and the physical courage to take it on and take responsibility. And that's what Kieran Carey did that day. He was absolutely magnificent, and it's one of possibly the greatest winning point ever scored in a hurling match, in my view. When you look at Connacht's football, Galway are the dominant ones, the great three in a row team in the 60s, and of course, in later years, then under John O'Mahony, really stylish victory in 98. You know, they beat Kildare in that great colourful final. Galway are the All Ireland football champions for 1998. What a day! Mayo, on the other hand, they seem to know nothing but heartbreak. So, as the saying goes, the backs go back, the forwards go forward, and now we are just minutes away from the start of the replayed 1996 All Ireland football final. You can't help looking at the story of Gaelic football without, you know, feeling pain that the Mayo people feel. 51 and 52, they had that fantastic uh, two in a row. But subsequently, every time they come near Croke Park, it's, it, it's painful, and finals in particular. It's a terrific setting here at Croke Park. 66,000 people waiting for the start. So away we go. And a huge leap in the air by Jimmy McGuinness straight away. All of the players, bar Tommy Dowd, incidentally, wearing gloves. At that stage, there was a feeling in Mayo at the time that the you know the, the physicality that Mead brought to the to the to their type of game at that time that Mayo needed to stand up to it. I felt that that year when 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 you analyze look back on it, I suppose Tyrone felt that, that Mead were over the top in the semi final and I think there was a big talking point after that. It was even on the Marion Fanukin show, the Joe Duffy show of now it was a lot of phone calls and everything else being made about the game. So I think Mayo felt that Meath, you know, roughened up Tyrone a bit and they weren't going to do that to them. And the, the 1996 All Ireland final, Mayo and Meath, uh, I was actually doing co commentating with RT with Jerry Canning on that match. In 96 against Meath, Mayo should have won. And the replay was famous for the fight on Tincident, where a row erupted. Attention early on, overflowing. My goodness. Oh, it really is ridiculous. Well, they all got involved. And some of them are still involved, just to the right of picture. And the row was extraordinary, because I think there was about 27 or 28 of the 30 players involved in the row. And the row moved from to the right of the goal, back across the field. It was all over the place. Everybody was involved in the row. I think that the referee is, well, I think that the referee is going to have to take some action there. That was disgraceful scenes. So nearly every player in the pitch was fighting. And uh, not Ireland final, we don't need them scenes. And I think you see the referee and the two linesmen now talking about it. They're going to have to take action and send people off. There was a lot of fisty cuffs thrown there, and they're going to have to take action and take it early now. I actually talked to Pat Nanganini about it afterwards and asked him. I mean, the big talking point was the send off of Lee McHale, and McHale feels very hurt about it even to this day. But uh, Nanganini said, the referee, that he said when he went on, he could have sent anybody off, but he, he felt that John he was going to send John McDermott and Lee McHale off. But he went to his umpire, the late Francie McMahon, who was a great umpire for him, and he said, Colin Coyle has to go. And the linesman as well said, Coyle was the man. Just shows you that, you know, replays can be dangerous, you know, because you, you, players get to know each other too well and some of these things can, can get nasty in replays. Maybe that's why, you know, it's better to have extra time in a game. Maybe the extra time the first day might have been different. Mayo might have won, might have won the All-Ireland. And they're both being sent off, it seems. Oh, sensation of sensations here. Both sides are down to 14 in the very early stages of the final. Lee McHale sending off was an absolute kick in the solar plexus for that Mayo team. He was a huge player for them and a very sporting player. And, and I think all these years later, Mayo would still look on the kind of randomness of picking two players out of that brawl and sending them off. Here's Brendan Riley. Will he be the All-Ireland final hero? Trying to set up a chance. The angle shot, and it's gone over the bar! Brendan Riley has kicked his first point of the match. And again, despite Lee McHale's loss, uh, 
Uh, Mayo ended up, you know, just losing by one point in the last minute of the game, and uh, the last seconds of the game, uh, and uh, certainly, you know, that still, you know, resonates with Mayo people as as I think my own feeling on that is that Mayo would have gone on to win more All Irelands if that one had been had had been got in '96. Back from Hall and John Casey taking it side towards Tom Riley, the substitute, the block there, superbly executed, and it's all over. Meath have won the All Ireland. But in the wake of it, there was an interesting sequel to it in that I had a phone in programme on Monday nights called Sports Call, where people would ring in about the weekend matches. And obviously, after this big, huge fight, and it was a huge talking point. So every call I got on the Monday night was from somebody in Mayo, you know, Brian and Bahola and Charlie and Castlebar. They were all ringing in, Seamus and Swinford. How disgraceful Mead were. I just want to say it was absolute disgrace and the trophy that they shouldn't be given the trophy for. That, that fight was outrageous. And it was on and on, Mayo people complaining about it. And eventually, anyway, a week later, and we're starting on the programme again. The first couple of calls are from Mayo complaining about how disgraceful and how dirty Mead were. And I said, lads, lads, come on, we have to move on now to the Mayo people. And, but it was just a series of complaints. But it led to a joke going around Mead. What was the difference between the Mayo football team and a porno movie? And the answer was you'd hear more moaning and groaning from the Mayo football crowd than you would. But uh, that probably summed up one of the great heartaches for Mayo because they were so close. And it's to Mead. And it's to Tommy Dowd. It's a tragedy for Mayo football that all these years later they still haven't won the All Ireland since 1951, and they 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 would look on 96. You know, I know they lost the final in 97 as well, but 96 they would look on it as definitely one that got away. <laughs> See, Wexford had this great, fantastic hurling team in the 50s. Great tradition and, and great success. They won the All-Ireland again in 68, and they were knocking on the door. In the 70s, they could never get past the Cork team in the all Ireland. That Wexford team lost in, to Cork in 77 and 78. They lost two successive All-Irelands to, uh, to Cork. And then Kilkenny came back and dominated an awfully. So Wexford were struggling to get back there. And when Liam Griffin brought them back, the resurgence of the old innate love of hurling in Wexford re-emerged. Well, I would say they had a very good team uh, for a lot of the 90s. I suppose Liam Griffin was the catalyst again there. Uh, Liam, just a fantastic way about him and a, an incredible passion for hurling. 1996, Liam Griffin took charge of the team and Liam had a great insight into the spirit of Wexford and they got through Leinster and got to the All-Ireland and I think there was nothing going to stop them. They played with spirit, they were gutsy and and they didn't give up and I think those are, are characteristics that the public will always be drawn to. Gary, it's going to be a free downfield. We've nearly two minutes of injury time played. The Limerick have no option but I think to drop this ball into the square and try and get a goal to try and win the match. Like they just seemed to think it was their year. We thought it was our year in 95, and they seemed to feel that way. And sometimes when you get that gut feeling that it seems to be your year. It's going to be Mike Houlihan from Kilmallock to love it. And it's all over, is it? It's all over! There was no time left, and Wexford are the champions. They've won their sixth All-Ireland final. The Liam McCarthy Cup goes back to Slaney side for the first time since 1968. I mean, one of the most emotional images any of us have ever seen is George O'Connor at the end of that All-Ireland final, 17 years in inter-county hurler, his hands completely disfigured from all the break, broken fingers, broken knuckles. And then here was this wonderful midfielder, this honourable man, after 17 years of trying and, and winning in All-Ireland. The team of 68 can take a back seat. It's now about the men of 96. Wexford are the All-Ireland hurling champions. Another final that Mayo lost was in 97 against the Kerry team. And what that made that extraordinary to me was 
The gap between Kerry's previous success, Kerry had dominated the 70s, the 80s, they're three in a row up to 86. And one was entitled to think, you know, this conveyor belt would continue forever for Kerry, but of course it didn't. And it took 11 years before they, they won again, between 86 and 97. Uh, Morris Fitzgerald, you know, was probably the star name on that Kerry team. But they had broken the, their long span without a victory. It's extraordinary that Kerry could go that long. And of course, as we were to subsequently see, it was to be the start of a new breath of life for Kerry. Again, Mac Benham goes long. And a chance perhaps presenting itself there. Dear McBurn was the player, and it's a penalty. I think one of the great things from a GA perspective is that there was a whole lot of other teams that had a chance of getting the ultimate prize. What's McDonald instead? And he's cracked at home! Mayo are right back in this All Ireland final. Uh, from the point of view of 97, that'll be remembered probably as Morris Fitzgerald's uh, final, uh, in the sense that he uh, took the game to Mayo uh, left and right, and he gave it, uh, you know, um, an, an exhibition that day. Morris Fitzgerald taking it on, and the man he's taking on, Pat Holmes. A kick by Fitzgerald that sails over the bar. He has shown us a streak of aggression which has been necessary. And from the freeze, as always, is near perfect. Mayo went into that game as maybe certainly with a 50-50 chance or maybe even slight favourites. I think that came about from the fact that Mayo had had uh, e easily beaten uh, Kerry in the, in the 96 semi-final. And you had a situation at that stage, I think, where Paddy O'Shea, who was manager of Kerry at the time, uh, felt that uh, they had one monster uh, and maybe celebrated a little too, too much or whatever. And there was a, maybe a feeling that Mayo in 97 then were favourites or, you know, this was their day to, to, to beat Kerry in the final. The All-Ireland final is firmly alive. There's a point in it. And John Mohan and his lads have got a lifeline. And, uh, you know, the, the feeling that Mayo came up short again was a huge disappointment to the county. Well, it wasn't so much they came up against Kerry, they came up against, up against Morris Fitzgerald, who gave one of the great individual performances that day. I remember him kicking a point from way out on the Cusick stand side, and it was just breathtaking. So Morris Fitzgerald kicks this one deep, right in there, and it's gone over the bar. And that's I think Fitzgerald, on his day, was one of the few players I've seen who was literally unmarkable. Fitzgerald has got nine points, and it's all right. Champions last in 1986. They have just won their 31st All-Ireland title. But there was one big difference. When you pull on the Kerry jersey, you have an innate sense of belief. You believe you'll win because Kerry people have seen so many winners around them. Every village has All-Ireland medal winners. That's a huge factor, I believe. The psychological strength you get from making the Kerry team because Kerry win and Kerry have been winners all along. The championship season is over for 1997 and Kerry are once again the champions and Liam Hassett, the captain, takes the cup. The Sam is going down to the sunny southwest. Everybody in Kerry has an opinion on, on the county football team. It's like a religion. Everybody. And I base this on having worked for the Kerry Man newspaper and lived in Kerry and played with Dr. Croaks and Killarney. Everyone has a view on how well the cornerbacks are playing or not playing. And they wouldn't be slow to say it. In Kerry, <laughs> Paddy O'Shea wasn't far off the mark when he said they're animals. They're animals in the sense they're raw in their passion for it. And if someone's not playing well, you know, they'll be told in Kerry, you know, that you're not playing well, you're not, you know, what's happening to you? Why aren't you scoring more? Why aren't you defending better? And I think that's a huge reason why they are so successful. And in the subsequent decade, the 2000 decade, they were to be so dominant you know, culminating with six successive All-Ireland final appearances. It's clear that we're looking quite easy for moments during the second half. Great match. David Fitzgerald's huge puck out. One of the most memorable moments of the last 25 years is the Clare Offaly hurling semi-final of 98. For the wrong reasons in many ways, it ended up chaotically. Uh, the referee, Jimmy Cooney, 
blew the whistle early. Clare were leading. They had been leading comfortably, but Offaly were coming back and coming back and coming back. And the referee blew up before time was gone. That's away by Kevin Martin. Not too far. Keenan trying to get it out. Barry Murphy trying to get it back in. This is the man. And the referee has blown up his whistle. But I think he's blown up before time. I think there are two minutes left. I think he was badly handled at the time. Um, we all have this memory of Jimmy almost being manhandled off the pitch. I mean, you could see it in his face. He realised the mistake he had made. But he was literally hustled off the pitch. And um, by then, it was too late to kind of um, bring him back out and restart the thing. Well, that is a strange finish. Time ran out. Jimmy Cooney's escorted off the field. It appeared that the game was over, that Clare had won, and that Offaly were going to lose out. Offaly were devastated and staged a sit-in on Croke Park and uh, made a case. And the Offaly fans came and protested on the pitch. They sat down on the pitch. It was just chaotic scenes, mad protest. Typical Offaly wouldn't give anything. They came and sat down and protested on the pitch. Can Offaly do anything about it? I don't know what avenues are open, but we'll have to object because the thing is that there's only 70, um, uh, 68 minutes played and there's at least five minutes to play. We're only three points down. We have to be fair. We're glad to be in the alarm and bus. It's not a satisfactory way, but uh, everybody makes mistakes. Obviously, Jimmy made a mistake today, but whether to have the result or not, then we'll be able to us, the referee's whistle was always the final, you know, the referee's final decision would have been it. And, so the dressing room was a bit funny afterwards. It was a funny kind of an atmosphere down there. But I mean, we went for a drink with the Offaly lads up there in the, the Clare's Lounge, looked out the window. And I remember Johnny Pilkington saying to me, would they ever go home? All the Offaly supporters were sitting on the field. And the controversy went on hour by hour. We went back to the hotel. We had a few drinks. We relaxed. We were in the All-Ireland final as far as we were concerned. And I think it was only Ger arrived down to the bar. It was about maybe eight or nine o'clock and said, lads, go to bed, we're going to be having a few pucks in the morning, there's a good chance this is going to be replayed. And eventually, Ger Lockdown conceded, yeah, we'll play a replay. Now, personally, I think Clare would have held on and won that semi-final. Offaly people obviously disagree. It went to a replay. Offaly were fantastic in the replay and won it and got through to the final. It was chaotic, way, absolutely chaotic way for a match to end. But extraordinary scenes. One of the interesting things in hurling about the late 90s was after the mid-90s success of the Clares and Wexfords and Offaly and Limerick being the dominant teams, in the late 90s it came back to the traditional counties and Cork winning in 1999. Jimmy Barry Murphy, the legend, in as coach and with a young Cork team. Jimmy Barry Murphy had been four years in charge of that Cork team and it took Jimmy a long time to get that Cork team playing the way he wanted them to play. When I took over the Cork team after a year I realised that Clare were the benchmark, that they had set new standards as regards fitness, uh, self-preparation, uh, the intensity of their play, the pace of the way they played the game. I think that was it. I saw them training in Park Heath on one occasion before uh, a Munster final and I couldn't believe the pace that they were training at. Yeah, they were a common team, but we... Funny enough, in my time, we had a fantastic, we had beaten Cork in 93, 95, 97, 98, which was weird for a, a clear team to, to win that many matches against Cork. And we would have certainly been very confident face into the Munster final of 99 that we would take them. The referee is Dickie Murphy. It's Clare who won the toss and up to play from, uh, from right to left. Having put his trust and his faith in a very young team, as I say, 14 of them playing in a first monster final. That's Fergal McCormick, Mc McGraw got back and it's deep! It's Cork people love their hurling. They've been starved with a bit of success. And then I'd say the dream thing for Cork fans was Jimmy Barry Murphy to be leading a young team of talented Cork hurlers. And that's what they got with their victory in 99. To be fair to Cork, they were hungrier and they possibly wanted it a bit more. And O'Connor Khan and O'Connor is putting over the bar. And the captain takes the cup, takes the salute.
I remember their semi-final victory over Offaly was a fantastic game. Awful weather. I remember Brian Whelan gave one of the best individual performances I ever saw. A real gutsy battling Cork team. It's an all-earned semi-final. We're delighted to be through. It's the uh, first time in a long time. And uh, we're really looking forward to the final now. There's a great rivalry between Kilkenny and Cork. Uh, what I recall about it, it, it was a very wet day uh, for a start, and Kilkenny were sort of keeping uh, a few points ahead of them. DJ Carey, the hand pass forward towards Charlie Carter. Carly with Justin McBloom, and Charlie has knocked it over the bar. The first point of the second half for Kilkenny, and they go back in front again. Towards the end, uh, Cork got on top and, and came back and scored a few great points to go, I think, a point ahead. This time, he takes great care and hits it with great accuracy. And Joe Dean has put it over the bar. A dramatic second half here. Kilkenny, first of all, leading and leading well. Then Cork fighting back gamely. Donald O'Cusack. And uh, ironically enough, Kilkenny people would claim that that was also a short game. Uh, from my recollection, there was a, a shamozzle in the, in the centre of the field in which a Kilkenny player was fouled, and in, in our opinion, he blew for a free for Kilkenny, and the Cork people invaded the pitch, and he just blew it off then, but we would have claimed that Kilkenny deserved a free at the last end, which would have created an opportunity to level the game. A day of triumph for Jimmy Barry Murphy, one of the great heroes in Cork sport, and now as coach after four years. On the day, you could sense they had the belief on the day, and um, they were deserving winners. I was here at the game, and uh, memorable victory, memorable as well. The cup was presented in the middle of the field for the one and only time. Welcome back to Lee Side, Lee McCarthy. We've missed you a lot. Yeah, Cork were back for sure, and you knew by the nature of the characters involved that they weren't going to be going away, they were going to be around for a while. I'll never forget the scenes at the end uh, when the Cork players would come down to the hill because the Cork supporters are great, they're so colourful and vibrant and noisy. The buzz was amazing, it was extraordinary stuff. And that was to be the start of a long period of Cork success in hurling, which probably marks every, every good decade, good Cork hurling teams. And they were to go on with Don Logue and The Rock and Sean Oak, you know, and the O'Connors. I mean, it's, you're reluctant to pick out names because there were so many uh, great players in those Cork teams. I think they won it by a point. Poor enough game. And what happened afterwards was, of course, um, Brian Cody was manager of that Kilkenny team, and no one could have seen what was coming. To me, Ulster football have really modernised uh, Gaelic football over the last uh, 15 years. There is no doubt about it. The, the likes of Nicky Hart, Joe Kiernan up there, I've mentioned Pete McGrath and Brian McGniff. I mean, the, these, these managers prepared their teams. They prepared their teams to come down to Crow Park and win. As the Ulster success continued, we had Armagh and Tyrone ready to burst on the scene in the early 2000s with those extraordinary scenes when our man won it under Joe Kernan in, in 2002. It brings the Armagh fans to life. 2002 then, Armagh met Kerry and that was a, another big breakthrough season, breakthrough for Armagh, first time ever. And we can just remember the, the field filling up with the, the orange and white jerseys. And then Tyrone finally, because Tyrone had been there and been very unlucky on many occasions. But when Tyrone came and won it, uh, with what was to be one of the great teams that I've seen in, the, in recent decades. They're swarming onto the field. Scenes of absolute delight. They had looked on for so many years at the southern counties and they were willing to do whatever it needed and whatever it took. So that 2002 and 2003, with the breakthrough of man and Tyrone, didn't happen by chance. It had been going on much earlier in, in the 90s, and, and this was the culmination of it. Well, I think we've seen it in the two decades, that 
it just takes one Ulster team to win and, and suddenly the, the others were looking at each other and saying, well, we should have beaten them whenever, you know, so I think it was, a, it was really much, it was really a psychological barrier that had to be crossed. And certainly when Armagh won the All-Ireland in 2002, Tyrone would have been saying, but we feel we're better than Armagh. So there, w there was no psychological barrier left there anymore. And of course, they're such close neighbours that it almost became a desperation in Tyrone. And they saw Armagh win in 2002. We can't let them off with this. We, we've got to do it now. So just four points between them. And again, it hots up. But just... And I think what, what Tyrone have done better maybe than any other county is they have a tremendous structure in place for young talent coming through. First two. Is our capable of being lads who make it happen? Tyrone, particularly, the underage structures are great in the county, and uh, they have a lot of ex-GA county players involved in management teams and involved in teaching in schools and everything else. So they've got the setup exactly right in Tyrone, and that's why you know they're one all Ireland. I mean, the fact that Tyrone won last year's all Ireland minor and Armagh won this year's all Ireland minor, you know, sometimes we look at that. Armagh as well are uh, doing a lot of work at schools, so I think that's what that's where you know other counties have looked at. But uh, definitely in Tyrone, and then you have Mickey Hart. I mean, he's been involved with the minor, he's been involved with the under 21, involved in the senior, and very good strong setup it's nearly like Ferguson and Manchester United at this stage he's been a long time with them but he's still able to get the best out of them and so I would always think that it was great to serve your time so to speak with underage management as long as you were prepared to grow with the players and realize that you were meeting different uh, challenges along the way and ultimately when the senior position came along in 2000 late 2002 November 2003 season it was a privilege for me to be there and to have the core of the players I was going to have with me come through the ranks with us across that decade so to speak and Mickey Hart and his backroom team have engineered a most wonderful success well, to be honest, when you ask about the, the All-Irelands that Tyrone have won since 2003 and say, could you pick one ahead of the others? It is almost impossible, it really is, because each in their own way have given us something unique. And for example, obviously the first one in 2003, well, how much more can, unique can you be? Like, you know, it's the first ever to happen in the county and just the aftermath of that and the emotion that it raised among the people back home and all, you really began to appreciate just exactly what it was in the team. Peter Canavan with Sam and Tyrone become the sixth Ulster County to lift the trophy. The winning doesn't happen in straight lines. There's setbacks along the way. God knows we have had them more than you'd expect. Obviously, the tragedy of Paul McGuire in 1987, seven years later then, in March 2004, the, the word came through that Cormac and Allen had died. I was on Morning Ireland and I got a phone call from somebody who was working nights and said they were led to believe that Cormac McAnallan was dead. When I got this story, I thought, that cannot be true. But it was such a bizarre thing for someone to say that, you know, one of our fittest and strongest sportsmen could have passed away in his bed. So I waited till around 7 o'clock and I rang a colleague of mine who was with UTV, Adrian Logan from Tyrone. And his wife answered the phone, and as soon as I said, it's Des, she said, oh, this is so terrible, this is so terrible. She was so upset. And I knew without even asking that it was true. And it is hard to believe that Cormac McAnallen, who was not just captain of the best team in the country, he was a leader, he was a role model, he was exemplary in his behaviour as a player and off the pitch, a young teacher. He had so much to give in the future and it was just taken away so suddenly and in such an inexplicable manner. It's still hard to comprehend. That was a serious shock to all of us. Such a good young man who was the height of his fitness and, and the height of health, so to speak. Um, this was a serious blow to all of us. But like the tragedy of Paul McGure, you know, we actually responded positively to that as a group of players and a group of people. We accepted that life throws you up some bad hands sometimes and you have to make the best of it. Mulligan, they've got to work a score from this. Owen Mulligan, options to his left, still Mulligan! Mulligan, what a goal! That is one of the great goals we've seen at Croke Park. Magic, magic Mulligan.
And I suppose we became better people for that. We became more aware of the families around sportsmen, and it wasn't just about playing the game, and that's all there is. It was about life in its totality, if you like. You know, you must be together, there must be a spirit within this team, there must be an appreciation of every individual, and you must try to help each other through difficult times. Allies on the match referee, and Nick Monaghan from Kildare starts the 116th All Ireland football final. But for my part, the 2005 one had, had, had very many special memories as well because of those epic battles with Armagh in the Ulster final, the Ulster final replay and then the All-Ireland semi-final. And to come through all that and to have 10 games and end up in the final and to have to play Kerry and to beat Kerry after 10 games, I mean, that is ultimately a special, a special year as well. And then 2008 had its own uniqueness too in that we lost it down in the first round of the Ulster Championship. We were virtually written off uh, that we were a spent force and all the rest. We came back through a tough enough sort of qualifying uh, rounds and uh, to get to the final again and lo and behold who was in the final against is only Kerry and they actually pull that game out at the time that mattered most as Brian Cody says there's only one time to be ahead and that's at the final whistle. The whistle goes and Tyrone are the all Ireland football champions for 2008. And at this stage in time you have to say Tyrone are way ahead of the rest in Ulster and you have Armagh coming close second and the one thing about Tyrone is there's no fear in them and I think Jack O'Connor and Kerry won't sleep happy until they beat Tyrone in an all Ireland final. Kerry go home broken hearted. So it's not about any individual player, good and all as they may be, or any manager, or any trainer, or coach, or anything else. It's the collective effort. And when everybody puts their heart and soul into what they're doing, and they are appreciated for what they do, then together we can all achieve a lot more. Part of the growth and the attraction of hurling in the 90s, which came with those sponsorship ads and that hoardings around the country and the TV ads you know, that created the, the legends and the giants of men, etc. In that time, Liam Griffin famously described hurling as the river dance of sport. It's the hand-eye coordination, it's the skill, it's the courage, it's the strength, it's balance required. And it combines so many qualities, plus, of course, crucially, the speed of it that make it in my view, unquestionably, the best field game in the world. And if you want to see all of these fabulous qualities brought together, the place to be is the Munster final. It's not just when Cork, Tip, Clare win. I mean, when Waterford won in 2002, what a day that was. The Waterford people who had been starved of success. Joe Canning is your commentator. Tip are unbackable favourites. Uh, to play Watford, I was um, I was always very worried about the game to be honest, because Watford are, you know, they have some some of the best players around at the moment are, are playing on the Watford team. At that stage, nobody had even heard of John Milan. And Watford making the breakthrough in 2002 in Parky Keeve, a packed Parky Keeve has a unique sort of an atmosphere. That was an incredible day, and, and to, for Watford to be tip on a big day like that, uh, incredible tip tip All Ireland champions going into that game, and uh, they were great games. It was a very wet day, uh, very slippy, but their, their first touch and their skill on the day was, was fantastic. Now, I thought, you know, Tip maybe were a bit complacent. It's like it's hard for a manager who's talking to a team two or three times a week to, to beat a population in a, in a county who's talking to them every five minutes saying, well, you're going to win this game. And it was a, it was a really dangerous game, and that's the way it turned out. Nicely inside here towards Ron McGrath. Like we realised there's nothing to fear. There was players on the Tipperary team that day that we thought, you know, would they get on the Waterford team? So from that point of view, we uh, just knuckled down and tore into them and we got a lucky break in the, in the, in the first half. We got a goal and uh, we went in at half time, I think four or five points down, playing into a strong wind and realised at half time, but these guys are very beatable. Stephen Brenner from the De La Salle Club. That is a huge freak. You couldn't begrudge that Waterford team and, and the style with which they won it, they played wonderful hurling and there was the sense of liberation that Waterford felt that day, I don't think anyone within the GA could have begrudged it to them, it was wonderful. That's a great pass. And once again it's lashed over the bar. I remember at one stage distinctly going to talk to one of the Tiberi cornerbacks more or less to uh, admonish him for one, something or other and I remember Owen McGrath uh, sliding out for a ball and uh, I don't think if he went in, you know, it was one of the, the best things I ever saw done. The ball skidded off the grass in front of him, and it, but within a foot he caught it and was up and passed it off to someone and, and put it over the bar. Milan balancing the contortionist 
I remember Ken McGrath just controlling the ball with his first touch and uh, straight over the bar. And like it's, it's hard to it's hard to beat that kind of uh, skill and when when it's working so well on the day. And they said the famine was over. The famine is now over. Waterford are the Munster hurling champions. First time since 19. 63. The first Munster Championship game I played didn't go so well against Kerry in, in Welsh Park in 93, so 10 years down the line, you know, all, all the training, all the defeats, you know, all the bad days coming out of Turles or Parky Creeve or Limerick. That great day we had in Cork in 2002 probably made up for most of them. I remember thinking that, you know, this, they've deserved this. To be a supporter of a county that doesn't win for so long, everyone should have their day in the sun. Unfortunately, that team has yet to win an All-Ireland final. In the last decade or so, they've made a huge contribution to hurling, uh, added great excitement, great for Waterford people, great for hurling and great for sport in general. So I, I think Waterford deserve uh, the ultimate honours. One has to remember a standout moment when Sean Ogo had been captain Cork to victory in, in 2005. The story of the O'Halpines, you know, the dad from Fermanagh, the mother from Fiji, as me and were here, they said, neither a hurling stronghold. They came to Cork, Sean Ogo was eight or nine when they came to Cork, the north side in the winter. They arrived in January to start school and he was different, obviously. He looked different, it was hard to, you know, go into a school and be accepted straight away. Hurling was what they played and Sean Oak decided, I'm going to play this, I'm going to become one of the lads. And, and of course, what a fantastic hurler he became, you know, in that great Cork half-back line. That Cork team made a huge contribution to hurling as well, at, you know, at a time when it needed uh, a boost. And they were a very glamorous team and Sean Oak uh, was, became an icon of the game. But what summed him up, Best of all, his speech. A young guy can come here having been brought up in Australia and immerse himself in our games and our language and be classy, be stylish, and deliver a fantastic speech that you know every Cork person I think is still very proud of. You know, a fantastic grasp of Irish fair play to him, I wouldn't have had that grasp, I should have maybe done a bit more of the whole uh, pegs here so when I was in, in Flannan's uh, instead of being in the alleys hurling, but no, he really, he was fantastically eloquent and it was reminiscent of of Joe Connolly all those years back in 1980, you know, when Galway made the breakthrough. And I don't think there'll ever be a speech for passion and, and the way the, the Galway Irish that, that Joe Connolly delivered, but there's no doubt that Sean Og, you know, very eloquent, very well spoken. I suppose lots of people commented at a time that he was a real, um, a real example of the Celtic Tiger that we had and was in full flow at the time. Current Liam Bacori, go over the hands on the Sean Og O'Halfane, cut down the floor now. But he was surrounded by a group of really dedicated Cork hurlers, determined guys. I mean, this all came to the fore with the Cork strikes that we saw. Uh, which were ugly and messy and they were victims, but it showed the resolute, determined side of Donal Logue and Sean, and the players in general. It was, they were probably seen as to the forefront of it, but it was very strong decisions taken by the players where Cork and County Board level was much slower to change and give more focus to county players than other counties. What worries me about what we've seen in Cork is that the strikes originally were over conditions for players. 
and subsequently they became, it seemed, over players wanting to pick their manager. And that's the depiction, that may be an unfair depiction, but it's a depiction that creates a problem for players in the public mind. However, the fallout from some of it was dreadful because yeah, subsequently Gerald McCarthy as coach, you know, a legendary figure in Cork Hurling, you know, on a personal level was to suffer greatly just because it became so antagonistic. That was one of the great shames in many ways for me of recent years in the GA. But it must be said that the Cork players set out just to improve the lot of the Cork player. They were not looking, in my view, for personal gain and they did achieve an improvement in the lot of the county player. At personal expense to the players as well, it took its toll on some of them, I've no doubt. The GA has to handle that very carefully. I think it's, 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 it's got it so right on so many levels, but player welfare um, is the one it's got to absolutely get right, and, and that's the biggest question for the GA over the next 25 years. One of the great things about the GA is that it adapts to change as it goes along. Now, sometimes it's been criticised for not adapting quickly enough, but I think, uh, you know, if you look, you know, administratively, like the big decision in the last 25 years has been the opening up of Crow Park to rugby and soccer. Liam Mulville must get huge credit for the redevelopment of it. He went and looked at other stadia, see what each of them had that was special and, and, and brought them together. It's such a magnificent place now. Commercially, it's so successful under Peter McKenna because it's busy and earning money for the GA all week long, not just on Sundays in the summer. It has the conference centres, etc. Um, obviously, the concerts. But it's more when the momentous decision was taken to open Croke Park, which was very divisive within the GA. A lot of people felt it should not be opened, and they made good case level they choose to. But it was a broader thing. Ireland had moved on and maybe matured as a nation. So you have these top international teams coming and playing in Croke Park. There is this disbelief that an amateur organisation can have a stadium of that level. I don't think anybody realised what a momentous occasion it would be when it was first used. And the fact that France and England were the visitors for the rugby season in that first year added to the drama of it. The first match was against France, where we were pipped for victory, which was a shame, but it was such an historic and momentous occasion. But of course, that was always going to be overshadowed by the second match there against England, given historically what had happened on Bloody Sunday in Croke Park. <laughs> But England were never going to win. I knew once our on the was sung, the intensity and the passion with which that was sung, the famous iconic pictures of the emotion getting to some of the Irish players, Jerry Flannery, John Hayes, John Hayes the bull, the biggest, strongest man in Ireland, the man we all look at, you know, the emotion, tears in his face. And that was visible on the big screen and it brought tears to everyone's eyes as they belted it out our on the with their chests out. Of course, the match was won with this passionate performance from the area. Yes! What a try! And probably was an appropriate way to wrap up what for me is one of the most memorable days ever in Croke Park. Lovely occasion. Proud youngster. As the GA has developed and become commercially aware, the marketing of the games has helped greatly. The reality is rugby and soccer are doing a great job in getting kids to play their games. But you see the jerseys now, the county jerseys, the replica shirts. Every kid has them. It's fantastic. It used to be English soccer teams that the shirts were. But the GA county jersey still remains unique. And the GA still remains unique as a sport because it is their own team, their own parish, their own county. And people, through wearing that jersey, can identify with that. great players in Kenny, but you need to be able to gel them all together. Um, it's the same with, with Chelsea in the, in the soccer there a few years ago. Uh, Roman Abramovich could buy any player in the world with, with the money he had, but they needed a good manager and they got that with Jose Mourinho. So um, I suppose there's kind of similarities there with, with Kenny. 
you, you've a squad of 30 and they all have personal problems, be some of them in college, some of them married, some of them in work, you know, have lost my job. There's a lot that a manager has to take on to keep a player's head right because obviously their players have other pressures coming in on them. Brian Cody's ability to keep his team focused and driven is extraordinary. And Brian Cody there with the county chairman, Ned Quinn, saluting yet another score. I suppose when I came into the job first, back in 1999, it was certainly, um, would have been regarded then, that was never again probably would have two all Irons again be won back to back. Jackie Turrell, the captain in 2006, another All-Ireland medal winner in 2007. The referee's calling for the ball and it's all over. And Kilkenny have retained their crown. They have won their 30th All-Ireland. Part of Brian Cody's big success, in my view, is his own hunger and drive. Just as we question how can players stay motivated for several years, it must be very tough for a manager to stay motivated. All of the Kilkenny players say that often their toughest matches are the games in training, the 15 asides in training, where there's 15 places up for grabs, lads, there's 30 of you, off you go, he doesn't blow the whistle, it goes on, it's tough, it's hard, you earn the right to wear the Kilkenny jersey. But I have to say that the present Kilkenny team um, are the best I've ever seen. And I, I think that if you could ever get perfection, it was in the All-Ireland final against Waterford in 2008. Just look at the setting. The waiting is over. Waterford fans have waited 45 years. They waited 49 years to get their hands on the McCarthy Cup. Will today be their day? I remember being with friends of mine from Waterford on the morning and going to the match with them. And it meant so much, they were so excited. There was the dinner that night, the banquet, on the phone to each other, just ringing each other just from the, for the camaraderie of the excitement and sharing the joy of being in a final. And of course, they were to be blown away by Kilkenny. <laughs> I don't think we expected the game to go that way either. Um, you know, not in the wildest dreams that we think that that was going to happen. There'd want to be some plan, some master plan to take the title from Kilkenny at this early stage. I think even at half time, I don't know, it was kind of a funny feeling in the dressing room. Like, I don't think, I think a lot of us even probably didn't realise the score was what it was, you know. Kilkenny lead in the All Ireland final by 216 to five points for Waterford. People said subsequently, you know, Kilkenny 2009, oh, they're not as sharp as they were in 2008. They couldn't be. That doesn't make them bad. In my view, we will never see such a complete All-Ireland final performance in football or hurling as we saw from Kilkenny in 2008. It's on Larkin. No mistake. 47 minutes of the game gone and Larkin gets his goal. All Larkin got an outstanding goal that gave us that bit of breathing space. And we went on then and we, and we came into the game more and more. And, you know, we turned in a very, very good performance that day, but it was a shadow of a doubt. We drove it on after half time, and I think then the last 15 minutes we knew, and, you know, we got some fabulous scores. And at that stage, you were able to kind of soak up the atmosphere, and you knew what was going to happen. And uh, it was great, great to be out in the field and uh, to be part of that, you know. It's quite a victory for Kilkenny. There was never any doubt. The final whistle, they beat Waterford by 23 points. The management doing a terrific job. When the final whistle went, I suppose, it was ecstatic. Um, we've been very lucky down here in Kilkenny to, to experience that feeling before, but uh, it was something, something different, something special, you know. The most complete performance in an All-Ireland final that I think I have ever seen. Unfortunately, we know what it's like to be on the other side of the coin, and, and I'm sure you know the Waterford lads are absolutely devastated because they're better than that. Well, one of the greatest teams, if not the greatest, I'll leave that to hurling historians elsewhere. I think the, the statistics are inarguable. You know, they've they've just dominated the game for the last decade. They have they've won four All Irelands. Uh, at the same time as winning four provincial championships, which has never been done before. Commons is ready, Shefflin is as well. They need it, it's in the back of the net! And I think the two collisions this year between Tip and Kilkenny in the league final and the All-Ireland final were two of the best games I've ever seen. And, you know, I'm nearly 30 years covering Gaelic games now, and they were just electric. 
And I think there were games that showed why, when it's played really well, with that manliness and with that intensity, there's no other game like home. The game has turned around, and the substitute, Martin Coverford, scores. But Brian Cody and as Don Michael Kenny, it's just, you'd only but be envious of it. Uh, to be able to have pay players and himself uh, motivated to want to do that again and again. It's, 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 a, it's a wonderful place that they're in, and oh, but we wish we all to be there. <laughs> Kilkenny have the trophy. It's Kilkenny who are the All Ireland champions for 2009. They are the first team to do four in a row since the 1940s. They've come from a position where they look to be. They're my favourite moments of the last 25 years. I know you won't agree with them all. I know you'll feel you, maybe your county should have been in it more. But it wasn't easy. Trust me, it was harder to leave some of the things out than we included. Hopefully, we'll have many more great memories and moments to cherish in the years ahead in the wonderful games of hurling and football. Thanks for watching. Yeah, but, uh, people may not realise Des was on a minor football panel with Dublin. Very skillful footballer and um, a very mean touch. Well, as far as I've seen, when Des Gahal is, is the, as they say, the consummate professional, and it's just that relaxed, comfortable style, and you know this man's in control of what he's doing. Damien O'Reilly, who works for RT, he's a good friend of mine. Damien is telling me that, I'm, that himself and, and, and um, Des and Gareth McDonough from, from TG Car were out in the Great Wall of China, and they were out there, I think it was during the Olympics and that there, and Des was out, and uh, they, 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 they just moon soon weather hit them, and, and uh, were soaking wet and the, and the three of them had to, had, to, had to actually strip off down to their shorts and they were running down and they said what do we do well, we better get a shop and buy a t-shirt or someone when, when it cleared up and Des walks into the shop with not on a pair of shorts and he says hello girls and the three girls just ran three Chinese girls just ran and hid when Des walked in the door